this, this corresponds to chapter six in the book. There will be a lot of calculations pertaining to your project. And we will need to understand those one by one. And I hope that actually I want you by now that you have the heat loss already. So we can apply these things as we go one by one. So you, you learn it in the classroom, then you try to apply it in your project. And uh, we'll try to go as slow as possible. I'm spending two weeks in this chapter to understand those numbers because they are very, very essential for you when you will work as an exact technician. And you need to do those calculations because, as we said, there's a lot of eyeballing going on in the field, and sometimes it doesn't work very well. And it's good to know how these things are done. Uh, I'm not sure you remember that long after you graduate, but at least you know where to look. You have the references, you know how it's done. And we will spend a lot of time in practice trying to master those little skills. And uh, there is some algebra involved. And if you notice, free algebra is a prerequisite for this course, so you at least know how to do free algebra. Uh, we can, you can always use a calculator. And most of these uh, formulas are in your book, available at the end of the chapter, you can see in the book. If you look at the back page, page 160, 29, you'll see all these problems. So it's good to know where they are so when you look, you can go it easier. Uh, I told you the quiz is open, both open notes, but it's not very helpful that you start to study during the, the quiz. So it's good to have tabs for you and dog ears, the pages you need so it will be easier for you to know where they are. And again, it's very, very concise. There's not a lot of uh, things put in there. Just put a tab or a sticker where you or label the pages that you need to so, with the heat loss, room by room. Now, what is the second step to do? We will buy a boiler. We're gonna get the entire boiler size by adding all the rooms together. Let's say we, want, we got a boiler of 60,000 BTUs. Okay, now, second part is <coughs> distribution. And there's a lot of finesse in that. Where do you wanna put the boiler? Where do you wanna put it? Is it just random? And it will make more sense now when you lay out the piping. And how many loops do you want? So it's all decisions we are going to make for the project that should be done in uh, real life. So we will learn first, selecting a heating unit for each room. What do I mean by that? Radiators. Radiators. How big is the radiator? Is it good enough? Maybe I need the kickboard. Maybe I need a convector. So. As you see, some rooms are small, some rooms are big. You want the correct heat distribution. If the room is so huge, and you put the convector or the heat only in one side, it will take a long time for it to distribute throughout the room. And probably you have to put a fan. Well, it's not going to be always possible to have a radiator going all around the room, right? So it will be a good idea to know that there are variations. I showed you from last week that there are different kind of Radiators, can you, we could combine uh, radiant floor heating with baseboard radiators, with wall radiators, with a convector. What's a convector? Okay. It's a radiator, big, dense radiator with a fan going through it. It looks like a box. It's very con condensed, but it, blow up, it blows out hot air because it has a fan in it and it will go slow and fast based on how much heat you need. Like for example, if you look at this kickboard here, it has a small little inducer fan in it. And usually they are located underneath a closet. So there's a fan here, small motor with a fan, inducer fan, and a big bundle of radiators together. So it's very small, requires a lot of pressure, and it's good to know what is the pressure requirement for these ones and how much heat does it emit. And uh, it's a very good, good choice for small, uh, small places, uh, spaces. So how do we select room? It's, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun when you go through the project and you find the kitchen requires 6,000 6, BTUs. And if we were to use regular baseboard, we'll need 10 feet of baseboard. So where I'm gonna put that? So 
So you might go to another option. So it's good to know there are options. You can Google all the time radiators and see what's new. They have new ones, they have faster ones. And also uh, ones that work with lower temperature. Some of them have fans in them. So you can have options. Side of the location of the boiler. So once we put the loops and we would like to strategize where we put our boiler. Does it make sense to put it really far away from the house? Usually, where do you see the boiler? In the basement. In the basement, where in the basement? Uh, by the chimney. Huh? By the chimney. By the chimney, sometimes. And what else? Where else? A lot of time we see it near the stairs. Yeah. The staircase. Because <coughs> the staircase is usually in the middle. And they want the boiler to be in the middle. Why is that? How is it convenient? If you put the boiler in the middle, then you have to have a chimney <coughs> all the way out. Why is that? Equal distribution. Yeah, equal distribution. It's going to be less piping. And again, depending on where the location is, is it good to have it near the stairs? Probably there's a lot of old ones that have been put in very random places. But it's good to know where's the best place to put the boiler. Do you want it to be five feet from the tank? Yes. You had a comment? <laughs> good. Uh, you had a comment? No. Yeah, the location because. I don't know. Yeah. A lot of older houses have the chimney right in the middle of the house. Yeah, too. so that's uh, another reason. So you gotta think about the vent for the boiler. You're gonna think of the electricity coming to the boiler and all the piping coming out. So you want all loops to be centralized in the house. Uh, number of loops. Again, you want to have at least two loops if you have two story house, but probably the old ones have only one loop. There's only one thermostat in the first floor, and they just count on the hot air to rise to the second floor. It's not a very efficient design, and if you look at some of these houses, they're very, very uh, not energy efficient. So the best way to do it is to have thermostats and zones. And now you know how to do zoning, right? We have one, two, and three zones. You put relay switches, different circularity for each zone. Uh, hot water tank will have its own zone. Its own <coughs> so the more zones you have, the less you can work out this boiler, and the more use you can get out of this uh, uh, heat. Picking the right tubing pipes for the entire house size. Again, I'm gonna give you just tips. It's not like the the commandments of the piping. It could be anything, but you can go with new piping. You have new advancement. So this is just general rules to go by. Uh, with smaller pool, uh, tubes, you think you will have more or less resistance? More, more resistance, very small. Bigger, more resistance. I mean, less resistance. So, but bigger tubes have more or less heat transfer. More, more. more why? More, more. more surface area, more water. So there's a, a give and take, and it's always a sweet spot where you can have the right flow rate and the right uh, heat distribution. And we'll, we'll talk about what is uh, general tube size. Usually for residential, they go with three quarters. That's the most common ones. But there are some circumstances where you might have to use to use bigger pipes. And try to simplify these things as much as possible. When I was looking at the IVR reference, it's a little bit not intuitive to follow the sizing. And uh, if there's one, I'll give you some formula you can think about. Uh, I know it's easier just to follow a table, but just as a common sense, mass and amount of water comes in is the same amount of water coming out. We'll work about that with that a little bit. Whatever water you put into the pipe, it should come out of the pipe. So if you have more branches coming into the tube than there is trunk of the tube, you're going to have an even distribution. I will illustrate what is that, what that means. So it's good to have tubes. And if you talk to some of the HVAC technicians, they'll tell you a lot of people who install those kickboards, they end up having it not working very well because they do not have the right pressure that goes through this kickboard. If you don't have the right pressure, you don't have the right velocity. If you don't have the right velocity, you're not going to have the right heat coming out of the radiator. Is that half inch? This is half an inch, yeah. yeah it's are they all like that? For, for no, they have, different, they have different designs. And you, if you see, the loop goes back and forth a lot, so it requires some pressure. And there are some that have diverted keys. 
which means it's a device that we put in the pipe that pulls some of the pressure, but not all of it. But there's a lot of pressure drop whenever you have those diverted keys. And if you put them before the kickboard, it's going to be, it's going to choke the flow if you didn't have enough pressure. That's why it's very, very essential to design a pump that can, require, that can provide you with the pressure you need for all the pipes. And we'll look at that a little bit. So think about the pressure. Think about the tubing. Not one size fits all. Think about the situation. I will talk about the pump capacity. How many pumps do you need and how big of a pump you need to select. We, and that's the last thing, pump requirement. Again, a lot of pumps, they are installed based on the previous ones, but models have changed. Pumps are more quieter now. They're cheaper, they're more efficient, but you need to know two things about a pump. When you go and buy a pump from a warehouse or a hardware store, two things they'll ask you about any pump. If you go in the online, there are two characteristics you have to know about a pump. If you can remember those, one is the pump head, which how much elevation this pump can go against gravity. And the second thing is GPM, GP, GPM flow rate. So GPM and flow rate, remember that, I'm gonna ask you that in the quiz, I'm gonna ask you that in the final, I'm gonna ask you that in the, in the project. What is the GPM and what is the head for the pump and how did you come up with it? So you go to take a website and you, or Home Depot or Lowe's and you look for pumps, you look for those two things. Pump, head, and GPM. How do we come up with those? It's very, very simple. I will show you the, the magic equation that will give you the proper pump head and the proper GPM. Uh, then we'll size the expansion tank. That's another component you need for all hot water system. I'm trying to focus more on hot water system because there are some equipment involved and it's the most common heating in this area because again, water has a lot of high, uh, heat capacity and people prefer sometimes to use hot water. So we'll talk about Thermal expansion tank. You know what it looks like. Yeah. Have you seen it? I will show you. You can have one here. So this is a thermal expansion tank. If you see, it has a membrane in it, so the water goes into the top, and this will provide some kind of pressure to keep the water under the right pressure in the system. Water, as it uh, gets heated, what happens to it? It expands. it expands. If there is no room for expansion, it might leak, it might ruin some pipes. So it's very, very essential to know what is the proper size thermal expansion tank. You can always oversize, but you wanna make sure that you, when you oversize it that you meet the minimum requirement. That's the main concern. And uh, as you add more components, you want to put that into consideration. Because again, every time you heat the water, you're gonna see some leaks if it's not sized properly. So this tank is a uh, one, it doesn't say a uh, hundred size. Three gallon tank, but it, uh, as you can see, it does not fill completely. So just because it's a three gallon tank, doesn't mean that it's gonna be enough for the entire water system. You might need to put two of them, and you might need to have a bigger one. And if you look here, there is a Schrader valve to keep that water under pressure. So this gets uh, pressurized. And uh, it has here some maximum, it's called diaphragm. Expansion tank, there's a diaphragm in here to maintain it. Maximum working pressure is 60 PSI, which is significant. Uh, maximum temperature is 240. And fill pressure is 12 PSI. So this one comes already pressurized, but you can go and check the pressure inside the shader valve. Do you use, do you use nitrogen usually? No, no, air. Yeah, air is just fine. anything, like an air pump? Yeah, air pump is fine, it's pressurized. <coughs> so that's the thermal expansion tank, and we'll learn the complicated, not complicated, the involved method to calculate the expansion tank. And again, most people, we just, like, you just eyeball it or put something that's not enough. We just want to make sure that this size is enough, or you can go higher, it's fine, but you want to be also pressurized. Where do you see this, and what kind of system? Hot water. Hot water. Plus uh, hot water. Do you see it in steam? No. No, it does not. So 
So this, well, this is your first indication to know that this is the steam or hot water. You see the expansion time. Because if you notice, the maximum temperature is 240. So if you have steam, you probably are around the two, 220. So it's very close to steam. It's going to be ruined quickly. So this is on hot water only. I've seen some steam system with expansion tanks. No idea why. That's probably malpractice. Because mm -hmm. this is going to be disintegrated in time <coughs> over heat and eventually it will leak. So something to think about. Okay, so sixth thing we'll talk about is thermal expansion tank. We'll go through one all each one of those slowly, one by one. Hopefully we'll understand how it works. And I think in the book I put some equations and some examples to help you out as well. <coughs> System control, what do we need for control? Come on, by now you should know. Aquastat. Aquastat. Thermostat. Thermostat. Primary. Primary control. And zone control. And uh, zone control for each zone. So by this week, actually, should be proficient in wiring those controls, right? At least, you feel 70% sure? That's enough. More than 50 is good. Hopefully, after this week, you'll feel around the 90. Okay, I can, I know how this works. At least you're not intimidated about the matter. You did it for six times. This week, you'll do it alone, and hopefully, take your time and do it right so you can go in a house. And uh, first thing you do is recognize the controls and where they are. And also, uh, what is our input for this control? The thermostat. So, where we're going to put the thermostat? Because this is our sensors for the temperature inside the house. And you have to imagine the hot air movement inside the house. As soon as it hits the thermostat, it turns out control the boiler operation, which gives you ideas on where you should locate the thermostat, right? Do you want to put it next to a stove? Do you want to put a light in the distant light next to the thermostat? Because it will overread the temperature. Do you want to put it in, uh, in a place where it's very far? Because the, by then you're going to get overheated in one part until the heat gets over there. And uh, that's also give you an idea where you will put your thermostat in your uh, design project. Okay, so here you need for each room, we think about the water temperature. If we look at this sample radiator, what does it say on it? Can you see? 590 BTUs at 180. Yeah, it says 590 BTUs for 180 degrees Fahrenheit water inside the tube, and that's per foot. This is a foot. So per foot. So if I have two of them, how many BTUs I'm gonna get per hour? 1,180. Yeah, 1,180 for two, and so on. And the water is still the same. At the same water temperature coming inside the tube. Okay. So this is the water temperature that we need for that component and each component requires different water temperature. What about radiant floor heating? The requirement is different, right? So mm -hmm. how do I, if I have the boiler making water at 180 or 190, I'm gonna have to use our thermostatic valve to avert the, the temperature, to get like, to have a combination for radiant floor heating at 85 degrees <coughs> and water heater here, radiator at 180, so that's, Again, another thing to think about. And also, you think the water kind of that's going to come in at 180 will go out at 180? No. No. Otherwise, what's the point? I didn't lose any temperature. Because it's going to come out at 60 degrees, 160 degrees. It will drop at least 20 degrees every at every radiator. How much? At least 20 degrees. If it drops more, it's a problem sometimes. But you want to drop at least one at 20 degrees. So two things go into this drop of temperature. Think with me now. The water comes in hot from here. If it's too slow, it's gonna drop more or less. More. More. <coughs> By the time it comes out, it comes out at 100. You took a lot of heat very quickly. If it's too fast, it's going to drop less. It's not gonna have time to interact with the pipe 
and drop a lot of temperature. So the velocity of the water inside the tube matters. We have to think about that. And that's why sometimes you have an even distribution of temperature inside the house. So there is some finesse to it. It's not just, it's, it is not just insulation. So we have to think about the water coming in, the water coming out, you can measure the temperature and see what's happening. Do we have to adjust every room? No, you have to, this is a, the, the importance of design. It has to be designed correctly from the beginning. Otherwise, it's gonna be an aftermath problem. You have to pull up the solution. But that's why we spend some time in doing the proper design and the proper math before you install. Because once you install, it's a little bit difficult to adjust. You have to put a, a damper on it, like a valve or something, or you have to take out some fins. I guess I was thinking about that, or you have to change the radiator. So it's good to have proper design from the beginning, but there's always solutions. You can also close the vents, over the vents, but again, you'll have an even distribution. Uh, amount of heat coming out of each radiator, that's important. Length of the radiator. So we said for each foot, this design will give off 590 BTU per hour for each foot. Okay, what if I have uh, 6,000 BTUs? I'm gonna need 10 footer. What if the room is not 10 feet? What am I gonna do? Yeah. You could have a double decker. Do you have one with like two tubes in it? You can stack it. You can use a convector. You can think of things to make the radiator a little bit more efficient. But this is very inexpensive. It's very common. Also, we talked about how not everybody likes these. If you block them with furniture, it's an issue. They kind of take a lot of floor area. Some people find them aesthetically unpleasing. So again, they have some issues with them. So there are options, but this is the most inexpensive one, and there are other, other options that work better and function in a better way. Options, so I will show you how these are sized. It's very common. Four mils, see how they are sized. Uh, so there are two types of those radiators. This one is the three quarter tube. I'm taking a very common size. That's a three quarter tube. Type A, there's also Type B. So Type A and Type B, this, this is actually a new book. You can write on it. That's uh, page 84. So you can look at it. Two, uh, three quarter tube and half an inch tube. So, based on size, type A and type B, very common. You can find the schematic on the online, also it's in the book. The first criteria is the water flow in GPM. Either one is the minimum, and four is the maximum. It has to be between those two. If it's faster, it's not, going to, it's not going to function properly. If it's slower, it's not going to drop anymore at the, the proper temperature. Second thing that we'll need to think about is the pressure drop. Why is this important? We'll know later that this is very important for the calculating the pump head. Again, every pressure drop, the pump has to compensate for it. So this is milli inch per foot of those radiator. What's a milli inch? One thousand of an inch, which is very, very small per foot. But again, you'll see how this when you have the entire hot will add up. And they will all add up into pressure pump head. So keep that in mind. There's a conversion for that. That's milli inch per foot of radiator. And this is the amount of BTUs it will drop at 65 degrees room temperature. Because the temperature exchange between the radiator and the room goes again with the same equation. Explain why. So imagine this is your heat loss to the room. What is our equation? Area times U, U, U times delta T. 
What will be my area here? Whatever, 10 times 5, whatever. No, if, if I'm going to do the heat loss of the room from the radiator, what would be my area here? Oh, I'm going to cut this surface area. area of the the pipe and the fence. So, just to show you, you don't have to know this, but I just want to show you the correlation. So, surface area. Two plus ten. U, what is U in this area? Wow. Thermal conductivity of the copper. Copper of the fizz. Copper and aluminum. Wow. We don't need to know that. And now, delta T, these are fixed now. You cannot do much about it because you buy it per foot. You're not making these. However, if you offer a company that makes those, probably you, they will teach you how to calculate the heat loss based on the number of fins you put in there. Delta T, water temperature, minus room temperature. So the colder in the room, the more heat you will absorb. At some point, you will stabilize and you will absorb less heat. Make sense? So if the room is at 50, you will soak more heat. As the room temperature increases, eventually, you will have the room temperature. It has the same temperature as the water, which is not gonna happen, it's gonna happen on But eventually, you will have less heat transfer from the room. If you go to radiant flow, again, it always has to be higher than the room, otherwise there is no heat transfer. What if the water temperature is the same as the room temperature? Nothing is happening. Zero. Everything multiplied by zero is zero. So now, this is the variation of the water temperature all the way to 220, even though it's above boiling, but the system could be pressurized. And this is how much you get. If you look at that radiator over here, at 180, it will give you 580, say it's 590, close enough. So this is how much you're going to emit, depending on how much velocity. If it's slower, Type one, it's gonna be less velocity, and, uh, less flow, it will give up less, here it will give up more, based on that <coughs> size. So it's a function of the flow rate and the water temperature. How is the flow rate is calculated? So GPM, gallon, is gallon surface area, area or volume? Volume. 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 You agree that gallon is volume, right? Yeah. So that's GPM, gallon per minute, GPM. So how is this calculated? So if we have water at the same velocity, same pressure water, which one will have more flow rate, more GPM? Huh? GPM or more, water. more water, or less water, or more water here? Yeah, I think more pressure. It's gonna have more pressure. Yeah, that Yeah, but it, the pressure is the same. Yeah. Which one will have more water coming out of it? Oh, A2. Yeah, big faucet, small faucet. Yeah. Big hole, small hole. So if you have a barrel, punch a small hole in it, there's gonna be a lot of pressure coming out, but less water. Mm -hmm. If you have a big hole, it will empty quicker, but it will not go as far, it's not as pressurized. So over here, it's gonna be more GPM. The unit of uh, velocity. Yeah. In what country? Anywhere. Meters per second. Meters per second. Inches and in column. Velocity. 
What is the velocity of your car? Speed. Miles per hour. Miles per hour. Miles per hour. So a unit of distance and a, mini, uh, and a unit of time. Okay. Distance over time, that's velocity. Ah, okay. Foot per second, foot per minute. Always kilometer per hour. So if I have pressure here, and I have velocity here, velocity here, velocity is foot per minute. Good? Foot per minute velocity. If I want to get the GPA, I'm gonna multiply. So GPA equal velocity times area. So foot per minute times, what is the unit of area? Square is square. Foot square. Inch is square. Foot square, inch square. Let's be consistent. We'll say foot square. Foot by foot. That's area. And therefore, we have here cubic feet per minute. <coughs> is cubic feet volume or area? Volume. It's volume, so we can convert volume to volume, and this will be eventually gallons. Just to show you the relationship between flow rate, which is volume per minute, we are doing volume, and the relationship between the area. What's that word by foot? Yeah? Yeah, it's supposed to be minute. Minute. <laughs> Basically, it's not GPM, it's a foot PM. Yeah, foot Q per minute. But who wants to, uh, nobody wants to use foot Q per minute. It's really complicated. And uh, it's more common to use GPM, gallon. And again, you'll find uh, cubic, uh, you find liter per second in euro, liter per second. And uh, again, the universal uh, time unit in the world is second. Here we have minutes an hour, but usually second. So that's the fundamental unit for, for uh, time. The fundamental unit for length, meter. meter. But if you come here, it's foot. And the, the relationship between foot and inch is kind of complicated. So again, just remember of a unit for length, Units for time and unit for volume and area. Well, we don't have to go too deep into it, but it just give you a, an idea of what's happening. Yeah. Do we have to transfer cubic feet to the gallon per minute or not? You don't have to, but it, uh, most literature is in GPM. And when we did the swimming pool, it was always gallons. Nobody wants to talk about foot cube. Same as BTU. Nobody wants to say like uh, kilowatt or something. Yeah. Or, uh, it's just like how it is known. I know it makes the HVAC field very complicated because we're the only one who use BTUs, but uh, it's not going to change. You just have to work around it. So type A and type B, we got that. So let's do a quick example. Let's say now I wanted to go and pick a radiator from my room. I found this room and I know how the BTU, you hide the Excel sheet, you hide your BTU a little. Uh, we do for that room. How am I gonna size this radiator? So let's look at this one. Room requires 5,000 BTU of heat. If we were to install type A radiator at one GPM, a water temperature 180, how many feet of that radiator needs to be installed? I mean, find out how many uh, BTUs. Yeah. Let's, let's On the table, we look at the table. Yeah, let's look at the table. Anybody have a table off? Go to type A, one gallon. Type A, go over yeah. one gallon. 550. 550. Fantastic. So now, now what, uh, what do I do? Multiply the amount of feet. Yeah. If every one foot will give you 550, I'll divide 5,000 by 550. And I'll get nine feet. Would Easy? That, yeah. Will that change? This is just like a nominal 
It's going to be 180 at one end. I'm going to change this, but again, you're going to go to the table and pick it up. And if it's not at the table, you'll go to the nearest thing. Let's say the water temperature is 175. I'm going to pick one of the, either you take the average or pick something close to it. Again, we're not trying to cool the engines for jet airplanes or rockets. It's hard to give and take, but within reason. If you go too far, then that's a problem, but within, within the, the neighboring soil should be okay. Does this make sense at all? Yeah. yeah. Anybody you need me to explain this again? Please raise your hand. Yeah. How did you get out of 550? We picked that from the table. Oh, you have okay. the table in front of you? Oh, my book. Yeah. So, page seven, uh, 84. The table is in front of you. Go on, look up. Table, look up. They're the best things ever. But you just have to know what, you're, what are you looking at. So, look at the table. Find this criteria, 5,000 type A, water temperature, one GPM, and try to match that. It's important to find those three criteria because they make a difference. If the flow rate is less than one GPM, or more than four GPM, it's gonna be an issue, but to touch them within these numbers. This is how it was calculated, yeah. So we would calculate that for each group? In yeah, yeah. So pick one radiator at the top. I'm not gonna have a radiator for every room that's different. It's not, it doesn't make sense. Unless, uh, unless you find something really, really absurd, like tw 20 feet, then I'm gonna look for something else. You know, and hopefully you don't. And uh, I said, if you have a big room that's losing a lot of temperature, a lot of heat, you probably need to try to insulate. Mm. The standards for the Department of Energy for ceiling heat loss is a minimum of R16. Minimum. They don't allow you to have sell a house or like this. This is the code. Every attic should be insulated by R16. Otherwise, you're going to lose a lot of heat all winter and you're going to cost people a lot of money to make energy and you're going to pay for it. Now mm -hmm. it's R39. There you go. Really? Last I checked was R16. Yeah. Probably improved it. For ceiling. And uh, the more the more they, they add that is because they not, now it's possible, there are more, more material. Yeah, our companies are working for making more better material to be installed. So 39, that's that's fantastic. Because again, you lose most of your heat from where? From your attic. For room is R19, or sorry, for walls. Yeah, R19, R19. Yeah. yeah. That's even, that's good. So let's follow those guidelines when you do the project. And it's gonna be very, very easy to go change the factor if you have anything else in there. So first thing, you're gonna go and like put your factors as is, and Look at the number. You don't want the numbers, go and check the standards, and you can change just the factor. That's it. You change the factor, and it's all going to change right away. And you'll see a difference. And you can keep two shots before and after. Wouldn't that be cool to show somebody? Look at your house. This is how much heat you're losing. And if I, if I do this installation, which is almost like <coughs> eight, a bit, I'm going to make save you this and this and much money every month. And to be an energy auditor, which is a really good job, and there's a lot of demand. I need you to show them some kind of math. For, for you to, approve, to be approved for math reading. Any question about that? So we looked up this from the table. This is what we found. We divide per foot to find the length of the radiator. Another one. Room is required with heat load of 7,000. It's to be heated with type B radiator at water temperature of 200 flow rate of two GPM. How many feet of radiator is needed and what is the pressure drop at that mm -hmm. rate? So let's, let's do that together. Okay. Uh, can we stop the video?